Thank you very much. Hi to everybody. My name is Jimmy Wynn, and I am president of Bitcoin Association. With me is Steve Shatters, who is the technical director of the Bitcoin SV node project, which we'll explain, as well as CTO of Enchain, the global leading research, development, and advisory firm in blockchain technologies. We're here today to talk to you about Bitcoin SV and why it is the massively scaled blockchain to meet developer needs. The answer to the question of what developers need is pretty simple, but it's very profound. Big power. If there are two things for you to remember today, it is big and power. Those two things in combination are what make Bitcoin SV what developers as well as big enterprises need. You don't have to just take my word for it. Chronoverse is an esports and gaming company in the United States, which has a monetization platform, which uses blockchain technology to create more transparent, fairer gaming in the esports world. It has a game that's coming into uh, open beta soon called Crypto Fights, which is like Dungeons and Dragons, and it allows players to create avatars to compete against each other. It recently announced through a blog post about why it was leaving the Ethereum-based engine token system to use Bitcoin SV as a blockchain for storing in-game items as well as many other uses. And its CEO and founder, Adam Kling, wrote in this blog post what we'll talk a lot about today. He wrote, we decided to leave because of problems with Ethereum. And what he explained is, here, I have to get the presentation back, what happened here, um, is that he explained that he and his company were making the best choice for their business. And the decision to transition to BSV was the result of their own research and development efforts. They discovered that Ethereum is at capacity, slow, cannot scale, it is expensive that proof of work is the only proven consensus mechanism, and they lack confidence that proof of stake or delegated proof of stake will work. And Ethereum 2's scaling approaches are still experimental, whereas Bitcoin SV has already demonstrated the scaling ability. They also summarize the benefits of transitioning to Bitcoin SV, that it can allow them to create a better item protocol with BSV, it's faster and cheaper to conduct trades due to the efficiency of the BSV blockchain. BSV is capable of handling millions of transactions without slowing down, which is critical to development work. And Chronoverse users will also be able to use more available features that Engine is not capable of, such as storing the 3D model of a virtual in-game item on the blockchain which is something that the Ethereum-based token system could not provide. So that is a great summary of what Bitcoin was born to be. Bitcoin, people think, is merely a payment system, a way to transfer monetary value. But in the name itself, we really understand what Bitcoin was supposed to be, a combination of data, bit, and coin monetary value, the fusion of both data and money in a ledger system, a blockchain. So that is why we fought a battle to preserve the original protocol of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has not been allowed over the years to be what it was born to be. Uh, it has been limited in its scaling capability, so people do not realize Bitcoin blockchain can power tokens and smart contracts and many of their advanced applications. So the SV in Bitcoin stands for Satoshi Vision, because Bitcoin SV is one of the competing chains of Bitcoin, but the only one which adheres to the original design, protocol, and vision of the creator Satoshi Nakamoto, to be both a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, where you can send monetary value, as well as the global enterprise blockchain for the world. And today, Steve and I are gonna to explain to you why that's important for developers and why that means it is the best blockchain for developers to learn, build upon. Bitcoin SV has four key pillars in our design, which Steve has led with another developer named Daniel Connolly, who is in Aust Austria. A stable protocol, a scalable blockchain at massive scale, security, as well as safe instant transactions. 
Today, I wanna to focus on the first two of those pillars and explain to you why that makes such a big power advantage for developers. Let's talk first about a stable protocol. And it's not just any protocol, but one with Bitcoin's original design. In February of this year, the team behind Bitcoin SV led a, the latest upgrade and hard fork of the protocol which was called Genesis because it was designed to restore as much of Bitcoin's original design and protocol as possible. That's because over the decade of Bitcoin's existence, former protocol developers have changed a lot of Bitcoin's original design. It had in it so much of the capabilities developers are looking for, for many applications, but those were changed. Those are restored through the Genesis hard fork. And there were many changes in it but the key things for developers to know are that we removed artificial limits that were previously imposed on the protocol, such as block size and transaction and data capacity. We restored the full original functionality of Bitcoin script, the programming language, which is used within the Bitcoin protocol. And Steve is gonna talk to you about that later in this presentation and what that means for developers. And we also removed some detrimental changes that were made to Bitcoin's protocol over the years, such as sunsetting what's called pay to script hash, which has created some significant privacy and security issues in Bitcoin. And this was designed to restore Bitcoin's original power. And then this is very important for you to know, to keep the protocol stable. Satoshi Nakamoto recognized this far back in Bitcoin's life, all the way back in 2010, 10 years ago writing at the time that the nature of Bitcoin is such that once version 0.1 was released, the core design was set in stone for the rest of its lifetime. Why is that important? It's because as developers, as well as people who might support big enterprises, you need a stable protocol in order to have confidence to build applications. I talk to a lot of companies as well as developers around the world who are looking for a blockchain to build on. And the one thing they do not want is a constantly changing protocol because otherwise it makes it very difficult to commit your time to start an application or start a venture or your business if you're a big company to launch an application on something where the protocol may change. So our team has committed to keeping the protocol stable now that the original Bitcoin design has been restored in Bitcoin SV. With the stable protocol, we also want to unleash the massive scaling power of Bitcoin. There have been battles for many years over whether or not the Bitcoin blockchain should scale. Because Bitcoin Core and the BTC network kept the block size small, its network is only capable of doing about three transactions a second or at maximum seven transactions a second that will nowhere rival or compete with the payment networks of the world, such as Visa, which average 2,000 transactions a second, or at peak periods, 56,000 transactions a second. Our belief for Bitcoin SV is that the Bitcoin blockchain can have unbounded scaling. There should not be limits placed upon its scaling capability by the protocol developers. So that limit has been lifted and the network can scale to whatever competitive market forces require. Steve and his team have been leading a lot of technical improvements and testing to ensure that Bitcoin can scale. This is critical because other competing networks, such as the Ethereum network, have run into scaling problems, which are very well known now. Vitalik Buterin in August of last year acknowledged that the Ethereum blockchain was almost full last summer that has led many businesses as well as developers to stop developing applications on that chain and instead look for alternatives. What's happening on Bitcoin SV? Well, there is no limit on the block size anymore, which means in any given block, there's no limit on the potential number of transactions or data that can be included. There are practical limitations that are being improved constantly, but we've seen world record blocks mined on Bitcoin SV that are not just one or two megabyte in size. In May of this year, two blocks over 300 megabytes in size were mined, which each had over a million individual transactions. That's great, 
but we can still do much more as the technical improvements continue. But it's scaling of this type that is necessary to create a blockchain for developers to have applications that can power many, many transactions. Our team also runs a scaling test network, which is continually uh, testing the bounds of what's capable on the Bitcoin blockchain. They've been mining blocks on the scaling test network that are 2.7 to 6 million transactions per block. And if that's sustainable, which we believe it is, and more on the main net, you're going to have theoretical throughput that exceeds 6,000 transactions a second. And that's what, as a developer, you want to see. You don't want to spend your time building something if you cannot support large numbers of transactions. It also means the capability to do micro transactions, meaning payments or data where you're sending small amounts of money that are attached to the transaction. And by small, we mean even fractions of a US cent. And that's possible because of the massive scaling. We're seeing on other networks such as Ethereum that there are periods of congestion where the fees that are required to send a transaction skyrocket, they get high. Here, for example, is from November of last year, there was a headline noting that the Ethereum transaction fees were soaring to over 30 US dollars to send a single transaction, which is far too high if you want to create tokens or smart contract systems or Internet of Things communications on a blockchain. Whereas on Bitcoin SV, because our scaling is unbounded and block size is now not limited by the protocol, transaction fees are not just really low, they're very reliable. They are not one cent tomorrow, but 30 US dollars a week from now. That is very difficult for businesses to predict their fee system. I just checked yesterday and to send a payment transaction on Bitcoin SV, the average as of yesterday was less than one hundredth of one US cent. That means you can create business models and payment systems that do many, many things. And it allows us to re-envision what the internet can be. A new world where all of our online interactions and online activity can be monetized, where you might actually have to pay a small amount of money to do things on the internet, but you can get paid back. And we're seeing in our ecosystem developers who are creative, creating applications where they are reinventing social media. So, for example, to stop fraud and fake accounts on something like Twitter, you have to actually pay to post a social media message or to reply and like. But then someone pays you back in tiny amounts of Bitcoin SV to your wallet in order to engage with your content, to like it, to reply to it. Uh, models where people pay to store your identity or data on chain, but then you as a consumer or user can get paid by authorizing companies to access your data on the blockchain. Small amounts, again, of Bitcoin. Same thing for reinventing how we access media. What if you had to pay per article to read online news as opposed to paying a monthly or annual subscription fee? So these are the fascinating types of creative ideas that can be explored if you have a blockchain where it costs only one one hundredth of a US cent to do any individual transaction. You can change how our entire online activity occurs. And it means we can move to a world where everything is not just online as the internet allowed us to create, but in possibility, anything could be on chain, your data, um, our interaction on the internet, such as web searches, our uh, e-commerce systems, everything can be recorded, tracked, and monetized through the Bitcoin blockchain as a ledger that combines your data with monetary value. That leads to this concept, which we call the MetaNet, a new, more commercial internet for all of us as individual users because we're able to monetize our individual activity and data on the online environments. There's a whole paradigm that's happening in Bitcoin SV, where we're taking a look at the blockchain as a universal server, where data, websites, and content can be hosted on-chain and accessed uh, via internet browsers and applications from a blockchain. There's a protocol that Enchain's team has created, which 
organizes the data structure uh, over Bitcoin so that people can create applications and easily find data uh, from the blockchain. So here's an image of imagining the blocks on the right of the screen as the blockchain, allowing you to store data, people creating search engines to access that data, you as a developer to create applications that leverage that data and allow people as users to even manage their identity from the blockchain, creating a new form of internet. So with this concept, and with this big power of the blockchain, with a stable protocol and massive scaling, what are we seeing that enterprises, as well as particular developers, can build on the Bitcoin protocol? So an example, which developers will appreciate, is a company called Coda, with some young entrepreneurs out of Australia. They want a second hackathon we ran in the Bitcoin SV world. And what they've created is an API marketplace for developers. Because it's hard if you're a developer, when you create you know, something unique and a software application, it's hard to monetize it. People put things on GitHub and uh, allow other developers to use it for free. But what if you could get rewarded for your work? So Coda has created a marketplace where as a developer, you can upload your work and charge other people, developers, companies, businesses around the world to use your work product by paying you small amounts of Bitcoin SV. For example, for every API call or every set number of API calls, whatever business or revenue model you want to set, which is possible because of the tiny, tiny transaction fees um, that it costs to send and engage in transactions on Bitcoin SV. Another good example is a company out of South Korea, um, a company called One Store, which runs one of the largest mobile app stores in South Korea. Uh, one of its uh, executives is a big believer in Bitcoin SV, and they created a mobile app called Buscon, which allows music artists to be able to be rewarded for their work. As a fan, you can download the mobile app, you can view, access, listen to content such as music videos from your music artist that you like, and then reward the music artist in a token called a touch token that is built on Bitcoin SV. And then the artist gets paid in small amounts of Bitcoin SV tokens. This has led as examples to a bright world of Bitcoin SV development, development happening across the world. Um, someone in Korea actually keeps a chart of the no known companies, services, projects that are on Bitcoin SV. And right now there's over 400 that are known. I'm sure there's even far more. You could see here um, a chart with companies and services. We won't have to talk about them all, but it shows you the number that's happening around the world. There's also resources for developers, as Steve will tell you about. And then also people are creating protocol layers to create the rule sets for all kinds of different functionality from smart contracts to tokens. And it's really expanding what is capable of being done on Bitcoin SV. Uh, a company out of Spain called Handcash, which runs one of the most popular wallets in the Bitcoin SV world, has created Handcash Connect. It's an SDK, which contains tool sets, you can see here, of six main functions, instant payments, encryption, identity, and login as examples, to make it easy for developers and businesses to integrate Bitcoin SV payments into any application, whether it be a web-based, mobile application, even um, uh, smart devices. So these are the things that are available to make it easier for you as a developer to start integrating Bitcoin SV into almost anything you can imagine. Recently, Maxthen, um, which is a, a company that provides a browser, which is one of the most popular in the world in certain regions, with over 670 million people having downloaded it as their default browser. They announced the beta launch of a new version of their browser called Maxthen 6. And it is the first Bitcoin SV powered browser. What does that mean? They're building a browser for this MetaNet world I mentioned where applications and online activity are driven by the Bitcoin SV blockchain. So in the future, the browser will integrate very easily with BSV applications. And you'll see here uh, a variety of the things that they're uh, already releasing. On the top right corner of the screen, you see something called Blockchain ID Manager, VBOX. 
this is a tool system to allow you as a user to maintain your identity information on the blockchain so it's never deleted and allow you to log into applications across the internet from a single identity data source. So you don't need, for example, to log into applications using Google or Facebook, as a lot of people do today. You can have all of your identity stored in one place on the blockchain, and the browser here is designed to specifically make it easier to log into applications across this new metanet world using a uh, ID system that is managed on the blockchain. Um, they're also creating a browser that will allow e-commerce sites when you're shopping to easily integrate with your Bitcoin SV wallets. You can easily pay, as you see in this example, on the right side with both your identity and Bitcoin from a wallet. So Jeff Chen from Maxon, who's the CEO, summarized very well why we believe so much in Bitcoin SV for development. He said, we want the Maxton browser to be the online application platform and user's window to the exciting world of Bitcoin SV combined with the internet. Our goal is to make it so easy and seamless to use BSV applications that users do not even need to know that BSV is involved in the background. Consumers will just know that using and earning electronic cash from their online content, data, interactions, and activities. This is the future of the internet and why we believe in Bitcoin SV. That summarizes well what we think is the future and what Steve will talk to you about next. Bitcoin is more than just a payment system. It is technology plumbing. That may sound boring, but it is the plumbing, the infrastructure, just like the internet protocol is that drove internet growth that will allow the creation and development of many fascinating applications so that in the future, consumers, users, will probably not even know that things they are using are built on the Bitcoin blockchain. It will work underneath invisibly to power world of data, microtransactions, and all of our future online activity. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Shatters now to tell you a lot about what developers can look forward to using on Bitcoin. Thanks, Jimmy. Just let me uh, transition the slideshow. Okay. Hi, everybody. Do I have the right uh, screen on the right screen? I hope so. Someone will tell me in a moment if I don't. <laughs> um, so here I want to talk to you a bit about uh, some of the things that are possible on Bitcoin SV um, that don't really fit the narrative of, uh, of what you could or should be able to do uh, with a blockchain. Um, just a moment, I'm told I've got my screens around the wrong way. You're good now, Steve. I'm good now? Okay. Yeah. So, um, in the in the very beginning of Bitcoin, um, Satoshi Nakamoto designed a system that was very open and had very few limitations. Um, you, it included an opcode that allowed you to push up to four gigabytes of data um, to, uh, to to the stack in a single Bitcoin script. In fact, you could use that opcode many times, so there was no effective limit to the amount of data that you put into a, into a transaction. Um, he made it very clear that Bitcoin was intended to scale and that the, that the end game for, um, for miners was to be operating out of, out of large uh, data warehouses. He also put an incredibly rich uh, scripting language into, into Bitcoin uh, that made it very clear that Bitcoin is not just about payments. Uh, Bitcoin is about anything that you can imagine um, that, uh, that is possible by, by using a, a, a Turing complete programming language. Um, but for a long time, that's simply not been uh, not been possible um, because, well, to be honest, a bunch of people decided that we just weren't allowed uh, to do that. Um, Bitcoin SV developers uh, do not want to be uh, the guardians uh, or the gatekeepers that say what you can and can't do on Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is a, is a free market, uh, and it really depends on what makes sense, uh, what makes sense uh, economically, what makes sense in terms of improving people's user experience, 
what makes sense in terms of improving people's lives uh, is what will govern what uh, what can and can't be done on Bitcoin. So let's step into a few of the things that are possible uh, on Bitcoin that uh, that don't fit the, the, the typical blockchain narrative. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, uh, the three bigs, uh, big blocks, big transactions and big scripts. And um, I suppose I'm, I'm speaking uh, to people here as, as potential developers um, because uh, I'm talking about the potential that can be unlocked uh, uh, as part of the developer experience. And we'll start with big blocks, um, but I make the point that big blocks are not something you should have to worry about. We're just going to talk about big blocks because they are what enables you to um, to do all of these things that um, um, that we've been told for so long are not possible. So firstly, why big blocks matter? Um, well, it goes to the structure of the network. And in fact, the structure of the network, the Bitcoin network that was described by, by Satoshi Nakamoto, and it's actually very different to the way that most blockchain networks look. And you'll see over on the left, uh, the title of this slide is minimal hardware where required. Um, what I mean by that is that as a developer or a user of Bitcoin, um, you shouldn't have to have a data center full of computing uh, equipment so that you can uh, participate in the Bitcoin network. You shouldn't even have to have a 200 gigabyte hard drive uh, so that you can um, uh, participate in the network by running um, the so-called full, full node software. Um, what happens when, um, when you have a, a world full of people that are trying to participate in a network on an equal footing like that is um, you develop a mesh network that starts to look a little bit like uh, the diagram that we have here. This is a very um, uh, small scale um, uh, imagining of that, but um, um, the typical Bitcoin interaction, um, it, if you consider the payment case, is, is usually between a customer and a merchant or a shop uh, in, in, in this case. Um, and let me show you how that works when you have a mesh type network uh, on a, um, uh, that, that is typical of, of most blockchains today. The customer and the shop already have a uh, connection to each other because you've gone to their website to say that you want to buy a thing or, um, or, or you're, you're trying to pay them. So the shop has already told you that you need to pay them. Um, but in a, in a typical blockchain today, um, you need to transmit that, um, that last message, which is the actual transaction through uh, from customer to, uh, to merchant. And, and this is how it typically happens. Rather than sending it directly to the shop, which would make sense because you've already got a connection to them, um, you hit the, the, the cloud of, um, of peers in the, in the Bitcoin or the Ethereum or the Monero networks, um, whichever one it happens to be. And your message, in this case, is a transaction bounces from box to box to box to box until it eventually pops out the other end. Now, on a good day, this will take five, 10 seconds. Um, on a bad day, uh, this can take uh, potentially 30 seconds or even minutes. Um, and if you're talking about a payment experience, that's just not good enough because um, we are competing with uh, with the payment experience that, that 7 billion people are used to, or maybe not 7 billion people are used to, um, to, the, to the pay wave uh, type FPOS experience. But, um, but we know that uh, you can walk into a shop, literally tap a card and um, within a, a fraction of a second, the transaction is done. So that's what we have to compete with. And, and five seconds is uh, even as it is, it's just not good enough. <laughs> So part of the reason we have this configuration uh, is simply because all of these nodes that you see on this on the screen right now are uh, are not actually uh, economically incentivized to um, uh, to to run on well provisioned hardware. Everyone is told that everybody has to run a node, but of course you're not getting paid to run a node. Um, so the costs associating with run, running a node are something that you're concerned about, and that leads to this mesh kind of network. Uh, configuration because the more connections you have with other people and the higher speed those connections are, the more traffic you're going to be sending and receiving and of course the more it's going to cost you. Um, and that's a real concern if there's no revenue coming in. But the way that the Bitcoin network was intended to be configured was that the people that are responsible for the connectivity are the miners themselves. And the miners are the ones that actually get paid as a part of the operations of the Bitcoin network. 
Now consider for a moment, uh, project, project into the future where uh, transaction fees uh, and transaction volume is high enough that um, just to pick an easy number to work with, let's say there's $600,000 worth of, of transaction fee revenue coming through every block, every 10 minutes. Um, now that sounds like a lot of money, but um, break it down over millions and millions of transactions, lots and lots of people paying a hundredth of a cent each. Um, it's a lot of transactions, but, um, um, but, but I'll show you in a minute why, why that actually becomes manageable. So $600,000 every 10 minutes, 10 minutes is 600 seconds. So that's $1,000 a second worth of revenue that's coming through the system. Now, if you're a miner and your network connections aren't up to scratch and you can't receive the transactions fast enough, even if you're delayed by five seconds in receiving uh, the transactions that everybody else is getting straight away, that's $5,000 worth of revenue that you're not going to get when you find a block. Um, and that's just you know one block in a 10 minute span. Imagine that over the course of a year. So miners are highly incentivized to spend money on increasing their network connection uh, capacity. Uh, and they're very incentivized to be connected directly to all of the other miners so that they can all grab and hoover up all of the, the transactions that are coming into the network because each one of those transactions represents revenue. And so what happens? The network starts to reform itself uh, into something that is much more like what Satoshi Nakamoto actually described uh, in, the, in, in the early days of Bitcoin. You see right there at the center, um, these are nodes uh, or otherwise known as miners. Um, they are the ones that actually uh, run the network, operate the network. They're the ones that are incentivized to have full copies of the blockchain, the massive hard drives that are required as, as, um, as, as blocks get bigger. And out on the edge, those white, uh, white circles there, they're actually peers. Um, I don't call them nodes, I call them peers, but they're actually the users of the network. And that can be people who wanna make payments or that can be applications, uh, that can be you know, very big applications that are serving millions of users. They don't need to see everything that's going on in the Bitcoin network. Um, they need to be able to see the parts that concern them. Um, and they need to be connected to a very, very fast backbone, which is what the, the miners provide. Now, I'm only showing five uh, mining nodes here, but of course that number um, can vary uh, quite significantly. Uh, and I would expect it to be more, but uh, there's only room for so many circles on the page. Now, remember back at the beginning of this animation, I showed you the animation uh, of, of, of this section. I showed you the animation of the transaction floating from the customer all the way through the network, bouncing around and eventually getting uh, to the, um, the recipient, which was the merchant. Um, so let's see how it actually happens the way that Satoshi described, because the very first version of Bitcoin included a feature called IP to IP which is the very definition of peer-to-peer. -peer. It's a peer with an IP address connecting to another peer with an IP address. This has sort of subsequently been removed from Bitcoin, but we are putting it back in. So this is actually how a transaction is supposed to flow. Customer and shop are already in touch with each other because they've decided to make a transaction um, and uh, you know execute purchase of some goods or services, etc. So the customer sends the transaction directly to the shop makes sense because the shop is the one that actually cares about getting the transaction confirmed. So the shop takes responsibility for sending it out to the miner. Now the miners are all incredibly densely connected. So instead of those five hops that we saw before, let's see what happens this time. Bang, immediately. As soon as it hits one miner, it's out to all of the others. And so you've got incredibly low latency. Um, you, you've actually got a, a speed of confirmation that um, that can match the, um, the the competitors in the fiat world. And not only that, but the, uh, the the miner that you send it to, and in fact, you could send it to more than one if you want to, can actually send you a response back and tell you the status of your transaction. So we'll get further into that in a little bit when we'll talk about the Merchant API. But um, back to the, the overarching topic, I guess, which is big blocks. It's big blocks that make this possible. It's big blocks that drive that economic model that, um, that uh, incentivize miners to, to form this, um, this backbone. Um, and this is just uh, an example. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the blocks I think that Jimmy actually showed you before, uh, showing the, uh, the 370 megabytes and 1.3 million transactions. <clears throat> um, 
these are a couple of charts that show the trajectory of Bitcoin SV over the last 18 months. Um, on the top here, um, this is actually a chart of the largest block in any 24 hour period. Um, the actual average, uh, it follows the same trend, um, but the number is, is obviously a bit lower. It's, it's still running at about double BTC and as far as I know is the largest of any of the blockchains in the world. But you can see that steady growth. It's um, it's a logarithmic curve. If this was a linear graph, then it would be a much, much steeper angle and, and it probably wouldn't fit uh, on the page. Um, but um, that capacity is there. It's been demonstrated day in, day out um, since um, since Bitcoin SV uh, emerged onto the scene. Um, and down below, again, is the same graph, but this time we're measuring the number of transactions per block. Um, so it's growing um, and uh, that keeps the Bitcoin SV team on our toes, of course, because we've got to make sure that the software can always uh, supply uh, as much capacity as, as there is demand for. Uh, and we're fairly comfortable. We're about 100 times uh, uh, further in front than we need to be, but um, um, it pays for us to always remain vigilant. So why do big blocks matter for you? Well, the fact that you can never run out of capacity is very important uh, from a fee perspective because it's only when blockchains run out of capacity that you start to see huge spikes in, in fees. There's not enough for everybody, so people start bidding against each other and they start bidding the price of the transaction up. Um, that should never happen uh, on a blockchain. There should be a market, but uh, the market is, uh, is there to determine how low fees can go, not how high they can go. And of course, from a developer's point of view, um, you don't want to be looking over your shoulder constantly and counting how many transactions your application is making and how many bytes uh, are, are in each transaction. Uh, you might even want to be able to use many transactions in, in cases where you've traditionally been told that you have to use one. Imagine a large payment of, a, let's say, $1,000 and um, you don't want it to be known to the whole world. Um, well, something that you could do is break it up into 20 small, completely separate transactions, which is something that would be unthinkable um, on, uh, on, for example, BTC or, or Ethereum uh, because of those transaction fees. So big transactions enable all sorts of use cases that, uh, that, have, uh, that are not at all common on, uh, on blockchains in general. I'll just pick a couple out there. Uh, Bitstagram is... Uh, Sounds very much like Instagram, um, and it's much like what you would think it is. Um, it's uh, you know image, images, your own images stored on chain. Whether SV is an archival service, uh, which uh, I think is going to be very useful for researchers in 50 or 100 years' time, because uh, the weather data that's being put on chain is uh, is immutable; it can't be changed. Um, if anyone ever tries to uh, use a fake version of that data, it's it's trivial for anyone to prove. Um, and of course, crypto fights, uh, I guess, the, the, the more fun end of, uh, of application development that you can hook into a blockchain for all uh, to gain all sorts of uh, benefits of immutability. Now, this last example is um, a, a little bit drier, uh, but uh, it's a really good example of why uh, scale matters uh, in terms of enabling use cases that, um, that otherwise would be impossible. EHR data is a big player in the USA, US pharmaceutical industry. Um, they're addressing a specific problem, the opioid crisis, which um, is in the news pretty much every day in the United States. Um, it's killing a lot of people. Um, and they're trialing a solution right now with Enchain, in fact, um, uh, for dealing with this prescription data uh, in an on-chain way. Now, this is health records, so of course there are um, uh, privacy is, is paramount, which um, um, whilst I, I won't go into all of the details because it would take too long, but um, it, it shows that uh, the privacy of on-chain data is, is entirely possible. Um, but one of the key concerns uh, that they had in looking at a blockchain solution was capacity. When this pilot is rolled out to, to a full-scale solution, they're expecting 3.2 million transactions per day. Now, how long would that take to process on various blockchains with the scale limitations that they have? Well, these are these are the rough numbers. Uh, Bitcoin would take 44 days to process just one day's worth of transactions. Uh, Ethereum, uh, quite a bit better, but still um, um, they, they would need a time machine um, since it's a little over two days. Right now, Bitcoin SV can chew through that many in 32 minutes. Um, and uh, with Terranode, of course, um, uh, it will heat them all up in a, in a single block. 
So this last section is um, it is probably the part that's closest to my heart because I have to admit I'm a bit of a script nerd. Um, script is the the programming language built into Bitcoin. Uh, for anyone who's familiar with Ethereum, you're probably familiar with Solidity, um, which is uh, something that Ethereum did incredibly well. Um, it's a really uh, easy to use programming language. But when you think about programming on um, on Bitcoin directly in script, uh, you probably think of something ugly and horrendous, uh, a little bit like this. Um, script is basically an assembly type language or a, a bytecode type language, and in fact, Ethereum has its own parallel to this. Uh, the Ethereum virtual machine runs off bytecode, which is very similar to Java bytecode. Um, and uh, in fact, for a lot of years, uh, you, could, uh, you couldn't even uh, make scripts like this because they were simply too long. There were limitations imposed uh, by, by developers, on, um, by the Bitcoin developers, on what you were allowed to put into scripts. Um, so all of the potential that's available here was, was not available uh, or, or not able to be used except maybe on a test net at home. Um, so this is what Ethereum Solidity looks like. Um, but um, but it gets a little bit better than this. Um, uh, of course, the, the potential for this is only just be beginning to be unlocked. Um, something that we'll be talking about extensively, I think, in the DevCon will be the new uh, IDE uh, contract programming language, Escript. Uh, there's others as well. That's it there on the right. Um, and I put them side by side so you can compare and see how, how similar it actually is to Ethereum Solidity. This has been one of the most important things I think for Bitcoin SV to address was the simple fact that the developer experience on uh, on Ethereum was uh, was so much better than it ever was on Bitcoin, and it probably won't ever be any better on um, on BTC. But uh, on Bitcoin SV, we've done something about that. Um, so Escript is available as a, um, a, a VS Code extension, which is a, probably one of the most popular IDEs uh, in the world right now. Um, and it's uh, trivially easy to use. And here's just an example of their documentation um, that shows how to do a Raven signature, which is uh, one mechanism of digitally signing data uh, in a transaction, any arbitrary data. And Escript is not the only one. There's also the Run platform, there's the Gear SV platform, and uh, at the upcoming DevCon, I'll actually be previewing a little pet project of my own, which um, I, I expect would be added uh, if anyone does a, a slide similar to this in the future, it might uh, might be sitting there alongside it. So I'm looking forward to sharing that. Um, so in terms of developer tools, I, I popped up this old simplified payment verification slide again, which you would remember from near the beginning of this. Um, it's, um, uh, it's relevant because I just want to show you one of the other tools. Um, that are available right now uh, on BTC. It's not that not that easy for a, a, um, a developer to even transmit transactions. You need to implement the entire peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and you're missing a lot of potential functionality um, that is is really important. For example, you can't find out what what transaction fee you need to attach to make sure your transaction will get accepted. Well, we solved that problem with Bitcoin SV um, with um, an interface the likes of which almost every developer in the world has probably uh, used and implemented before, a simple REST interface. Um, and it's a very simple API, but it's run by miners and it allows you as a, either a user, a user who wants to make a payment or a developer who wants to build an application to ask a miner directly how much fee, what is it, what exactly is the fee I need and can, you send, can I send you a transaction? Yes, I can. And can you tell me whether you've accepted the transaction or not? Um, it seems like such a simple thing, but it's uh, it's just not been possible on um, on other blockchains. Um, and this is one of the first things that we wanted to address with Bitcoin SV. So of course, there's um, a world of developer resources, and again, that will be covered more in more detail in the in the DevCon. But just a couple I want to point out to you. Um, in fact, I saw this in the chat earlier on. Uh, someone uh, someone mentioned the wiki, wiki.bitcoinsv.io. Um, it's a great resource for learning about Bitcoin from, from the ground up. Um, it does have a bit of a technical focus, of course, but, um, but it also uh, tries on some of those pages to sort of really explain the, the general concepts of Bitcoin. 
Um, another resource I really like is BSV Devs, um, which uh, points to a lot of uh, you know, tools and um, uh, developer tools and, and various other, other bits of tooling, as well as just some fun applications. Um, so I recommend checking that out. Um, and of course, uh, part of the point here is to uh, to speak to developers. Uh, I would be remiss of me as Enchain CTO not to uh, throw in a plug here and say that we are growing. We're by no means the only ones um, uh, getting involved in Bitcoin SV development uh, is uh, is a really interesting potential career path. And uh, whilst we'd be interested in talking to uh, to people who are are um, uh, a few, a few steps along the way through their, their learning experience. There are many, many other in, uh, companies uh, um, who are operating on Bitcoin SV right now. And um, I think there will be many, many career opportunities going forward. So I'll turn back over to, uh, to Jimmy to wrap up. Um, and uh, I'll look forward to answering some questions shortly. Uh, Jimmy, I can't hear you. Are you muted by any chance? I have. I have. I have ended it. Hi, all. Sorry, I was trying to sort out things. Let me just wrap up um, before we take questions by uh, telling you about a few things that are coming up soon. Um, I don't think I need to show the slides. We have a hackathon that's happening right now um, uh, that goes for two months. Um, the competition period just started about a week ago, and it ends August 18th. It's our third Bitcoin SV hackathon. So you can enter as a individual or as a team. A lot of people like to participate as teams. There's still plenty of time to sign up. You have the opportunity to win up to a prize pool of 100,000 US dollars in Bitcoin SV for a first, second, and third prize. The theme is to build applications that connect the world to one global blockchain because we are big believers in the fact that the Bitcoin blockchain and Bitcoin SV can support uh, all of the world's data. So to find out more, go to um, bsvhackathon.net, and that is one of the great initiatives from Bitcoin Association. In addition, we have a developer conference coming up July 18th and 19th that we're partnering with We Are Developers on. Uh, that will be two days with a lot of information, content, 
and uh, advice from the Enchain team as well as many companies across the world to help you learn how to build on Bitcoin SV. You can register on the wearedevelopers.com site as well as find out more information at um, bsvdevcon.net. That's July 18th and 19th. Um, so it's coming up soon and it's free to register. So we hope lots of you take advantage of that opportunity to learn more about Bitcoin SV. Um, and that is, uh, those are just some of the interesting initiatives we have. Bitcoin Association is the global industry organization that advances the business of Bitcoin SV. Um, if you want to get involved and learn more about what we're doing, visit our website at bitcoinassociation.net. As an individual developer, you can apply to become an affiliate of the association. Our memberships um, are, are really focused on businesses, but if you're not involved with a business that is a member, become an affiliate of our association and sign up and get lots of information about what we're doing in Bitcoin SV land. Uh, we're really excited to bring Bitcoin SV to the world. We think it is going to be the global blockchain for enterprises and developers with big power. As uh, Steve said, big blocks, big transactions, big script, and big capabilities for everyone. Uh, with that, I think we have some time for questions. Um, so Steve, one of the questions is, is there a specific language you have to use for the DevCon? Uh, a specific language you have to use? Well, no, I mean, the DevCon itself is more of a, um, more of a, a learning event, I, I suppose, but, um, there'll be a number of tools which will be shown off, some of which are actual languages, um, uh, themselves. So, um, uh, the aim of Bitcoin is not to be language specific. Uh, for example, Script is, is one particular language that you can use for scripting, but of course you don't need to actually get uh, down into the weeds of Bitcoin scripts to make use of, of Bitcoin. There are plenty of tool sets available in all sorts of languages, to, uh, JavaScript, Go, Python, Rust, Java, um, uh, any anything you, you can imagine probably, um, there, there are tools available. So use whatever language you're comfortable with. Right. Problem with the fluctuating price for BSC or BSV or other other blockchain tokens. For some use cases, yeah, it is um, it is problematic. And um, uh, but uh, well, I'll I'll get to to addressing those problems in a moment. But for many use cases, it's not at all um, to use. Bitcoin SV as a, as a utility ledger, um, often what you're not transmitting is large amounts of Bitcoin back and forth, you're transmitting data and, and in fact the value carried in the transaction is the data itself, not uh, not the amount of Bitcoin that you're, you're transmitting. So if, in those sorts of cases where you might only have a few Satoshis attached to a transaction, uh, dust amounts, um, then these fluctuations aren't, uh, aren't really going to matter. Longer term, though, of course, payment uh, use cases and um, and anything where the where the satoshi value of the transaction is is significant. Of course, it, it, it does matter, but I think that this is simply going to be something that will settle over time as usage picks up. Um, it's the the usage and the velocity of money in any currency um, that dictates how volatile currencies tend to be. Um, the U.S. dollar, for example, is um, is, a, is a pretty stable currency because of the sheer amount of trade that goes on uh, in it every day, trillions and trillions of dollars every day. Um, so, uh, and it's not so much even the dollar value that's moving; it's it's just the amount that it's moving around, and and, and how much people need to um, to to have and acquire it to to use it for something. Um, so that's a, a longer term uh, problem, but um, uh, I'm I'm confident that it will will be solved. And in the meantime, there are plenty of other ways to use Bitcoin SV. Question: Are there any plans to remove the twenty five? Uh, um, transaction limit. Um, well, it's not the 25 transaction limit anymore. It's the 50 transaction limit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the answer is yes, of course, uh, there is. This is probably the most asked question um, that, that, that I get. Um, the unfortunate part of the answer is it's a lot uh, easier said than done. Um, there's layers and layers of, uh, of legacy code that have been added by um, BTC developers over the last 
last 10 years that we're slowly unpicking. We're getting very close though. Um, by the end of the year, I, I, I will bet my, my life and my, my job on it, um, that we will have it fixed by the end of the year. There's a good chance um, that um, we'll have that limit substantially increased within the next few couple of months. Is there a place where you can get information about BSV scripting, how it works, how to program it, and capabilities? Um, I would say probably one of your best resources is, forgive the shameless plug, the upcoming DevCon, uh, because there's at least two, uh, two presentations that are going to be specifically about uh, Bitcoin script in different ways uh, that you can make use of it. But while there's a pause, there was a comment earlier on. Um, somebody pointed out that I had a small little network on my wall. Um, I just thought I might show this because it's taken me almost a year to, to actually get framed. And I don't know if you can quite see, see that. There's a little bit of a hint as to what this actually is. Um, so this is actually an image of the Bitcoin SV network seven days after the hash war in uh, November 2018. Um, it's a limited edition because um, uh, one of our senior architects who uh, collected the data and built this diagram um, gave it to me and then I made him delete the file so that it would have some, uh, some uh, rarity value going forward in the future. So. Can we get dust limited transaction outputs reduced or eliminated, Steve? You certainly can, uh, and it's simply a question of when, not if. Uh, we are again actively working on this. In fact, we're working on a on a feature that sort of goes hand in hand in this, which is enabling uh, what I call consolidation transactions to be free. Uh, that is where you have a large number of uh, of inputs uh, spending into a small number of outputs. Uh, by doing that, you're actually um, reducing the size of the UTXO set, which is a net benefit to miners. Um, so it makes sense to give them the option of that being able to be done for free. And that opens up a world of different use cases. Um, um, very, very micro payments. Uh, you could offer a service that someone uh, as a, I guess, a value add to an existing transaction where someone just adds even a one Satoshi output uh, to you as a third party service provider. Um, now that's not very useful on its own, but uh, if you sit there and collect them enough and once you've got a thousand or, or whatever, um, then uh, you just make one of these free consolidation transactions and put them together into a, into a single amount that's actually useful again. Next. How to build simple web app on top of the blockchain? <laughs> Um, how Answer that in three seconds. How long is a piece of string? A really good way to do this is to go join a hackathon or something like that. There's a lot of helpful people around that will, will help you. Um, one of the quickest onboarding um, libraries, I suppose, that I know of would be Money Button. Uh, there's others that, that, that do similar things, but it's, it's one that I know well. Um, so go take a look at their API. And uh, I know people have, have built an application in less than a day using that. So. Will there be systematic courses for beginners in the future? Let me address that one. Um, Bitcoin Association, one of our key initiatives for this year and next year is really what you're seeing to launch developer education and training initiatives. So Raylene Wilson is our technical program manager overseeing this. And the answer is yes. Uh, we will be launching uh, later this year a variety of uh, online training programs, one in conjunction with a technical university that we're partnering with, and another just put up by Bitcoin Association with the goal of providing both basic Bitcoin training for developers and then moving to a more intermediate and advanced levels, allowing developers to uh, complete online courses through an online education curriculum, take assessment tests, and eventually we want to create a certification program to be able to certify the developers at different levels of based upon the completion of our online education. So look for more information about that later, but it'll be coming and launching later this year. Steve, do you have any comments? I think he means, is that the Maxim browser? I think that's what the question means. Um, I, I've, I've not actually had a chance to look at the Maxim browser myself uh, in, in depth and in detail, but um, 
one thing I suppose that I will say about it is that it is at least a year or two ahead of when I expected it to be. Um, not Maxon specifically, but a browser that was geared toward uh, toward MetaNet applications. I thought this was going to be something that would take quite a long time for someone to build. Um, so the approach that um, that the team has uh, has taken, um, I, I personally think, is really impressive. Um, I uh, I look forward to seeing how other people start integrating it and um, um, and uh, and making it uh, part of the, the the daily Bitcoin kind of user experience. Yeah, I encourage everyone to download the Maxon 6 beta, test it out, check it out, play around with it. I've started doing it myself. I know Jeff Chen and his team are definitely open to any feedback, comments. It's just a start and they're willing to take all kinds of suggestions for, for that related to Maxon. Um, uh, Jeff and his team are also uh, launching something called NB Domain, which is creating a new form of domain system for the blockchain. Like we have a, you know, internet URL domain system. Uh, he's leading a initiative to create create uh, a new domain system for the blockchain world. So I think that's really fascinating to watch as well. Steve, will be a better alternative for op false, op return, or it's the final solution? Will there be a better alternative? Uh, certainly not the final solution. There's, uh, there's plenty of other solutions out there right now. Um, one thing that I'm kind of hoping people will start to explore uh, in the near future is embedding um, data in, um, in spendable outputs. Um, for example, um, so people that are familiar with some basic scripting, the typical pay to public key hash uh, type of script, um, uh, all you need to do is put an op return at the very end of that script and then you can put more data on the end of it. Uh, or before the script, you can push data and then drop it again. Uh, off the stack straight away uh, is another way to, to embed data. So um, that solves one problem that a lot of people I think have been, um, there's been a lot of debate, hot, hot topic on Twitter uh, lately, what happens if miners don't keep all of the data? Right. Well, that's one solution is put it in a spendable output and they have, have no option. Um, they'll probably charge you a higher fee for it, but um, um, uh, but it, it shows that there's, there's many choices and, and many ways to do things uh, in, in, in Bitcoin. What I can say is op false op return won't ever go away. Uh, it's possible now. We're not going to be changing the protocol again. So there's nothing to stop you from using it that way if that's how you want to. What are your favorite BSB projects? Jan, what a tough question. Ryan, it's um, it's like asking someone, a parent to choose among their children. What are our favorites? Um, there are so many great ones out there. That's so why I, I personally can't name one. Obviously, I think things like each our data's um, pilot project to uh, use the blockchain for opioid pharmaceutical prescription management and creating a bigger mission, the global electronic health record so that consumers, patients can be consumers of the healthcare data and monetize their own healthcare data. I think that is fantastic because it demonstrates really the much bigger potential and vision of what a global blockchain can be beyond just a payment system. That's just one of my many, many favorites. And the other answer is anything Steve Shatters does. <laughs> Steve, uh, you have any favorites you want to mention? Do I have any favorites? I mean, there's a, there's a lot that I actually think are, are really impressive. Um, S scripts is is one that um, that uh, really knocked my socks off so much so that it inspired me to start uh, my my own weekend project uh, doing something uh, kind of similar. Um, Bitping, formerly known as Uptime SV, not a fan of the new name, but I understand that Uptime was just uh, asking for a trademark lawsuit down the track. Um, I think that's a really clever way to um, to, to make use of, of Bitcoin uh, SV yeah. and Coda. Um, I mean, I was on the judging panel for, for, for the two hackathons and they, those two won, uh, won a couple of them. So um, that shows. For those people who don't know what uh, Bitping is, it's a crowdsource and uh, essentially network intelligence for monitoring website up and downtime as well as other services um, that use you know, uh, user mobile devices and devices around the world to provide that information, you know, managed on the blockchain. Yeah. Do you plan to support pay ID? Uh, pay ID, if I recall rightly, I think this is a, um, uh, an identity mechanism that was recently released uh, and available 
Um, it's meant to be sort of a payment mechanism agnostic. It, uh, it addresses BTC, it addresses ACH transfers and, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, whether I plan to support it, well, I don't have any business that, uh, that personally needs it. But um, do I think that um, a standard that promotes interoperability between payment systems is a good idea for BSV to support? Uh, yes, um, yes, I do. Interoperability uh, will help people to onboard uh, onto BSV, and um, if a bunch of uh, um, user-facing applications are implementing this standard, then it makes it much easier for those applications to integrate with SV in the future. So. Yeah. On that note, I, uh, I'll take this moment to mention for our audience that one of the initiatives Bitcoin Association has uh, launched and recently announced the uh, initial committee members for it is a technical standards committee for Bitcoin SV. Uh, we know that technology develops much more quickly and grows if there are interoperable standards. So Steve is chairing the technical standards committee to evaluate just this exact kind of topic in many areas, what standards um, can be recommended so that developers and businesses who are creating applications in the Bitcoin SV world um, can create things that communicate, interact, and interoperate with each other. We think that's really vital. It's one of the things we're de doing to lead the professionalization of Bitcoin. Where would be the best place if I could talk to others about up coming up with ideas for the hackathon? Steve. There's a lot of different forums where um, where application developers hang out. Um, of course, the hackathon itself has its own Discord channels where you can um, you can probably uh, reach out to other devs. Um, and I think that the um, the platform itself uh, um, has facilities to help you with finding teams. But outside of that, there's uh, there's a few Telegram groups. There's um, um, the Atlantis Slack that's run by Unrider, which is a, a common hangout for for developers. Um, um, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of time to sort of hang around in all of these these various places. So there may be may well be others that I, I don't know about. But um, uh, here is a good place to start. We'll go to any one of those and, and ask other people. Um, generally, people are pretty friendly and, and uh, willing to uh, willing to help new people get on board. So. Thomas asks, do you always have to compare hash outputs to create a locking script base on op push terms at TX, or is it possible to unlock without knowing in advance exactly what the output will look like? I spotted this question and um, I'm still trying to work out. I mean, I know that you're talking about op push TX and um, hashed outputs as a part of the seek hash algorithm. So this is a very, very technical question, but um, I, I'm not quite sure what the specific use case is that you're you're thinking of. Um, I'll push TX is uh, is a technique that's quite close to my heart because I've been um, forgive the pun, but I've been not pushing it for um, for the last few years, and it took a while for someone to, uh, to to grab onto it and actually try to implement it. Um, so I might take that question on notice so that I can actually give you a sensible answer rather than a um, uh, than trying to guess what you what the question means and, uh, and getting it wrong. Oh wow, Henry! What a question! How long shatters until BSV transactions per second rivals that of Mastercard and Visa? Steve, give us a definite time. <laughs> well, I mean, in terms of capacity, we're, we're pretty close. Um, the the long-term average number that has been cited for the whole lifetime of Bitcoin is 1,700 transactions per second. And um, we know that in, um, in in short bursts of a few hours uh, that the, the SV network is already capable of, of handling that. Uh, their peak capacity is is quite a bit bigger, but that's uh, that's about fifty thousand. That's probably going to take um, a leap beyond the Bitcoin SV node software and into Terra node. Um, uh, the Bitcoin SV may 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 be able to achieve that, but we're, we're sort of unsure. Um, but I'm personally working on Terra node proof of prototyping myself. Um, it's one of the the few projects that. Um, that I, I, I dust off the old uh, old keyboard and, and, and get in and code uh, myself, but I generally don't have a lot of time for, for coding because I'm too busy organizing things at Enchain. But um, uh, we're making really good progress with that, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to doing some demonstrations uh, of it so as soon as soon as I can. I'm going to get myself into trouble if I name any kind of a date. Um, 
because uh, uh, of course I'll get held to it. But I would like to be demonstrating it uh, before before the end of this year. Mm. And for audience members who don't know what Terranode is, it is an enterprise class version of the Bitcoin SV node software that is designed to support, as the name suggests, terabyte size blocks, you know, million megabytes plus for massive, massive scale. Steve and team leading an effort essentially to reconstruct the, the Bitcoin node software from the ground up using a microservices architectural approach um, to create far more efficiencies. So look for more information about that coming in the near future. When will the courses for Bitcoin engineers start? Um, I don't have an exact date, and the uh, but uh, I know we're hoping to launch um, our partnership with uh, a tech university for um, a massive online open course um, sometime in the fall of this year, uh, probably around October, we're hoping. And then our Bitcoin Association formal online education curriculum, uh, we're hoping to get some of that by end of the year. Do you have a timetable for changing the DAA, the difficulty adjustment algorithm? Tim, Donovan, gosh, all these pro questions. Steve, what do you have to say about that? I, I get asked this one a lot, and um, I, I honestly scratch my head sometimes wondering why it, um, why people are, are um, so interested in it, because it doesn't really impact the sort of day-to-day -day user experience all that much. Um, the one thing that is notable about Bitcoin SV is it actually really doesn't matter if we go for an hour or even two hours without a block, because um, when one eventually gets found, uh, everything just gets cleared out uh, in, in one one hit. So, um, But the answer to that question is it's, it's dependent on transaction volume, um, because the old 2016 block difficulty adjustment algorithm uh, creates a vulnerability for a low hash rate chain, um, which we call chain death attack, um, whereby someone comes in with large amounts of hash rate from somewhere else, uh, pushes the difficulty way, way, way up and then goes away. And if you're in a situation where it takes 24 hours to find a block, um, well, uh, that two week period is actually measured in blocks. So it becomes 2016 times 24 hours. Um, and that's not an ideal situation to be in. But when you've got large amounts of transaction volume coming in and fee revenue, it changes that dynamic completely. So um, we've been doing some studies uh, internally on what different levels could have create what sorts of scenarios in, in terms of if someone tried to pull off that, that, that sort of um, uh, attack. Just to determine where the where the kind of safe level is, and um, I've got some answers on that. Um, I'm there are security concerns, uh, which is why I'm not just blurting everything out that I know about it right now. I'm going to think carefully about uh, about um, uh, how to approach this from a, from a public discussion point of view because it does need public discussion. Um, but I think the short answer is it's definitely not going to be this year. Um, uh, my guess would be it would be probably mid. Uh, sometime, probably not before middle of uh, next year, um, and um, maybe you know towards the end of end of that year. Um, but as soon as we actually have enough data to be able to say, yeah, it's the, the it's the right time to do it, or at least plan it and start setting a date, then um, um, then we'll, we'll be talking about it publicly and um, getting as much public feedback as, as possible. We are like coming to the end of this time box. Um, we answer a last question. Sure, uh, one last question. And then um, everything which comes after that is something I will uh, forward to you and see that we get the answers published so everybody can see that. So, and the last question is, what do you see as the next steps required for the wider use of micropayments? Hmm. Steve, you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, so uh, a lot of the building blocks are, are, are either coming, are either in place, or they're they're just sort of coming into place. And and a lot of this comes down to that animation that I showed you near the beginning of um, of my presentation. Which governs the flow of a of a of a payment interaction between uh, between two parties. Um, so there's multiple parts of that. There's uh, how do I find the person uh, to connect to them directly, which uh, PayMail is uh, is one of the potential you know, one of the solutions to that. 
there's how do I get the transaction directly to the miner promptly and find out that it's definitely being accepted. The merchant API is a, is a component to that. Before all of that even happens, though, there's the um, the negotiation between um, um, the uh, the merchant, the seller, and the um, and the customer, uh, and that's part of Bit270. Um, so all of these uh, components are coming together, and of course they need to be implemented not just by miners or, or any particular service, but all of the wallets uh, as well, so that they can work to operate happily together. So um, completing the work on all of those steps, I think uh, basically defines what that pathway is. Um, how long it will take, I'm, I'm not sure, because it, it requires work to be done by a bunch of people that aren't me, who I don't, uh, I can't uh, compel them. Um, but there seems to be a pretty strong appetite amongst many of the wallet applications to, to get on board with this, and um, a lot of work's already been done, so um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the progress. That, that's the, I think, technical behind the scenes answer, I think, from a practical industry and ecosystem perspective. The answer really is developers like all of you on this um, program who are listening, designing, creating, conceiving great applications that drive people to want to have some functionality that uses micropayments, something like Coda, where developers can make money through an API marketplace. So it's the ingenuity and the creativity of developers creating really powerful applications that have real utility, things people want to use, whether they even know it runs on Bitcoin or not that um, leads to real usage. So we encourage people to just get building. That's what we really believe in in the Bitcoin SV world, building a blockchain and a digital currency with real values. So build really useful applications that will make people want to use them and that will drive micropayments and the future of Bitcoin. Cool. So thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Steve, for your cool presentation and for all the ideas you planted inside my head. Um, I'm sure I will be there on July 18 and 19 uh, and see you again and hope to yeah, stay in touch. Um, so for all of you who haven't already registered, this could be your last chance, but it's not. Um, say bye-bye um, to everybody here on Click Meeting and everybody here on YouTube.